Hi, I'm Heidi Alexandra and you're watching UQTV. At UQ Power, we believe it all starts with you. And we love nothing more than finding people and brands who are building a life and building a brand that is right on their UQ. And today I'm bringing back for you a fantastic person, Lisa Messenger. Thank you for joining us, Lisa. My pleasure. It's so good to be back here. I love you guys. Such an awesome community. And it's wonderful to have you here in The Hunter and I hope you've had a chance to see some of the fabulous entrepreneurs that we have here while you've been here with us. Fabulous views, fabulous entrepreneurs, fabulous food with you guys last night. I may actually move here. Ah, did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> so. Daring and Disruptive, your mm. latest book yes. is fantastic and, and I think everything about your brand, it's almost magazine in style itself. Yeah. Tell Thank us a you. bit about your inspiration behind that and, and what kind of response you've been getting. Uh, well, the, the inspiration for the book, which sounds ridiculous given the magazine was only launched like 18 months ago, but um, yeah, and a lot of people have said to me, how on earth did you have time to write a book on top of that? Um, but the reality is that I think people are kind of fascinated by how I started a magazine with no magazine experience at all, um, with a team who had no magazine experience, and it's now in 35 countries mm. and kind of growing massively all over the world so I kind of almost felt like it was my duty to because writing a book takes you know a lot of time and effort mm. and money um, but to put it out there to kind of share the story because the whole mandate as you know of the collective is the story behind the story so I thought yeah. well it's probably time that I shared my story behind the collective so and it's been extraordinarily well received mm. um, We've just been permanently ranged in airports around Australia, which is huge. Oh, and fabulous. Yeah, I'm getting lots of good feedback. So, yeah, very grateful to, to our community. Excellent. And I understand there might be another one that's in <laughs> planning. Is that right? Yeah. So, uh, as you know, I just came back from three weeks overseas and um, I, the catchphrase and the hashtag seems to be Necker to Newcastle at the moment <laughs> from Richard Branson to Heidi. <laughs> um, and yeah. And so while I was away on those three weeks, most normal people um, would have a holiday. Yeah. But I actually wrote um, a 10 chapter draft to my next book. So yeah, so uh, which is a bit weird and sounds a bit, you know, overachieverish, but it was I love writing and I don't get that much time to actually just write. So for me it's kind of almost relaxing and it just flowed out. So yeah, really excited about that one Great. as well. Yeah. And so going back to the magazine then and yeah. the fact that you love writing, how mm. hands off are you when it comes to the actual the writing, the content and all really of that. Really hands off. Okay. Yeah, so um, unfortunately almost, like obviously I'm kind of provide the architecture and the, you know, the structure for how it all comes together and I approve all the stories, but um, we have 70 something writers now all mm. over the world, probably, um, you know, only 20% of them are in Australia. So we've got writers in New York and Berlin and Paris and London and everywhere. And I don't have anything to do with them. So I've got right. my deputy editor and um, some of my senior staff in-house who commission all the stories, appoint all the writers, um, you know, and then, it, and then it sort of has a process of going to, um, you know, through a whole editing and proofreading kind of fact-checking process. And then they kind of come to me for a quick squeeze over before they actually hit the hit the page but um, yeah it's sort of funny you know because it's grown so much I'm so involved in kind of the vision and the big strategic stuff and um, all the brand extensions and the brand building and um, you know overseeing all the different country negotiations and all that kind of thing I don't really get that involved ironically in the day-to-day because -day, I mean the collective is kind of the main thing that everyone knows about but yeah. there's so much else going on with the brand so yeah. Yeah, so, but that's kind of the cornerstone. Which is kind of a nice segue, I guess, in the, the fact that there is so much involved in the brand now. Yeah. And you started with a why, but also I hear how much you fly by the seat of your pants and see opportunities and grow. Yeah, yeah. But also that you're still strategic in what you're doing. Yeah. Has the vision or the big why changed much or is it still the same consistent and it's just got 
morphed into other ways? Yeah, so it's a really good question. So the big why hasn't changed at all. Mm -hmm. And the big why is about empowering entrepreneurs globally to show that anything's possible. So that is absolutely concrete in my mind. And I'm just an entrepreneur for entrepreneurs, living out loud and you mm -hmm. know, making all the mistakes and taking all the risks and failing and doing everything that everyone else does. Um, the actual products um, absolutely are morphing, pivoting, changing every single day. And that's in response to a whole lot of things. Um, <coughs> one, financial pressures and commercial realities. So, you know, I have to keep, like a print magazine alone will not stand up, will, you know, and that's why unfortunately so many of them are closing. So, mm. um, so I've had to, you know, create events and products and speaking and all sorts of other things that happen around that and that that's kind of fun because it's totally in response to the community and you know we kind of test products as you know all the time and see what people want and some of them work and some of them do not mm -hmm. they're complete flops and so yeah so it's I think it's really important to be nimble and flexible and able to adapt and move really quickly you know mm. if you're stuck if I was stuck on one particular this is how it's going to be and that was the only vision then no so I laugh often people say to me oh where are you going to be in five years I'm like I don't know where I'm going to be in five minutes seriously yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um you know I think there's beauty in that because it gives you the ability to keep keep moving yeah. and, and keep fluid and fresh and you know you could say to me Lisa let's start a blah in Newcastle or hey I've got a great idea let's produce these white jackets together and I could say okay cool that makes commercial sense I think my audience is going to like it let's do right. it so I'm not tied into anything which is kind of a great way to be and very scary for some people. Yeah and I was going to say it's a bit like David and Goliath almost mm. more nimble I guess than some of the other bigger yeah magazine yeah. houses <laughs> we are very much so and and I think that's I mean that's been one of the greatest lessons people say to me all the time you know oh I can't start a business because I don't have the experience of an industry or I don't have the funds or I don't have the team and I say well that is BS because <laughs> I have none of that and the reality is you know in this country there's five and a half thousand print magazines and um, we're consistently sitting in the top 10 now and I'm not a Bauer or Pacific magazines and to put that in context context for the listeners you know Bauer has over 80 magazines to wow. its name mm. but the reality is around that that some of the titles um, you know like L magazine there's 43 other L's that exist around the world and so it's really difficult for those guys because um, unlike you and I who can say let's create a white jacket in an hour yeah. <laughs> or, you know, let's f see the idea and let's start to make it happen. You know, if they wanted to do that, it's such a laborious process. It's probably, you know, a six to 12 month process mm. to get it signed off in Australia and then overseas and everything else. So, um, so there's beauty in, you know, and in naivety and also in just being able to do whatever you do. So I guess my lessons there would be do not hold back because you think you know you don't have the money or the or the team or or the infrastructure or whatever it is because I know that that's not to be the case I know that anyone yeah. can do anything like absolutely anything and so given that you're always living in that possibility zone of yeah. anything's possible yeah. and responding to you know, opportunities yeah, as yeah. they arise yeah tell us a bit about you've just been to Necker Island with Richard Branson and I'm sure people would love to hear about how did that come about and what did you learn from spending some quality time with him? Yeah, so I was, you know, humbled and it was one of those pinch myself moments when I was invited to go to NECA, but even more so when I arrived and, um, and Richard had just had the whole Galactica incident happen and so, you know, I was questioning will he actually turn up and we arrived five o'clock in the afternoon, um, James Bond-esque style in these power boat, like extraordinary. <laughs> and you see the big house on the hill and things. And then Richard arrived at 10 o'clock the next morning. And so, you know, one of the first lessons I had from him was, you know, commitment. He said to us, uh, you know, I'd made a commitment to be here and so I'm here. And the second thing was that He's so incredibly down to earth and humble and normal. And, you know, he my first encounter with him, he walked in in his board shorts and bare feet and put his feet up on the coffee table and, you know, and that's where we started chatting. And 
uh, you know, and I had so many lessons with him. But you know, he's just—he was so accessible. And Neca is literally, which I didn't realize until I'd gone there, it's his home. Mm -hmm. So you know, we spent time hanging out in his sitting room, which is essentially um, attached to his house, and he built it for the elders. So Nelson Mandela and Jimmy Carter, and um, you know, all those guys. And and uh, you know, it, it's—he's so accessible, and it's just the most extraordinary. Um, community of people mm -hmm. so yeah but I can tell you lots lots more about yeah. what I learned and things but yeah his humbleness and his um, willingness to kind of invite us into his home and share that with us I was just blown away by yeah. and what about his philosophies or how he manages he's got so many businesses and I guess yeah. you're seeing your business grow as well how did he manage all of his people and keep his cultures going and yeah. was there anything you could learn there Ah, oh, absolutely. So one of the things is, I think he said to me, he's got over two hundred businesses, and I mean that's that's a lot of businesses to have. And uh, and one of the things he said to me was that he's never um, he's never had an office. Basically, you know, he mm -hmm. I think he worked from his boat and he's worked from his home. And he said, which surprised me, he's been one of the most hands-on dads in the world to Holly and Sam, and. Um, and it made so much sense because he said, you know, when you're in the office, you're kind of like the top dog, you're the go-to person. And so everyone's always at you. And I know what that's like, and we talked about it. I walk to the bathroom and there's just people coming at me all the time. And it's funny because in the three weeks I've had away, I said to my partner, Jack, I've got so much done. Yet when I'm in the office, I'm so busy. Am I being productive? Mm. Um, probably not. It's just that... You know, my team are amazing and they're so perfectly capable and so my plan now is to spend a lot more time out of the office and just empower them to make their own decisions. You know, I think as soon as you're there, they just, they ask you everything. And yeah. as soon as I'm gone, they make the decisions on their own. So that was a really great lesson because I think, you know, as an entrepreneur and a visionary and someone who needs to stay across the strategic stuff and the, the high level, um, the high level stuff, yeah, I can't be down in that detail, mm. you know, day in and day out. And I noticed that yesterday I got back to the office and there was something that I thought would have gone to print three weeks ago and it was something so simple and I'd already signed off on it and then I got asked, oh, what about this? And I was like, I don't really care about that. Like, it's so irrelevant, just do it. And, mm -hmm. you know, so so that's that's what I'm going to plan on doing a lot more Excellent. of now. <laughs> Which is probably some great lessons for our viewers and listeners as well, thinking yeah. about... How do they build their team? How do they start to empower and delegate? That's it. And and just on that, and I think this is something we've talked about before, um, I mean, I, I'm able to, you know, I've only got, I think, 24 or something full-time staff, but then we've got 70 plus writers and, you know, 35, well, different countries. And within each of those, there's like a whole host of different distributors and different things going on. So there's probably something like 300 plus people working on the collective now. but. Um, the day-to-day -day reports that I have, you know, are very few really. Like of the 24, mm -hmm. there's like four main sort of divisional right. managers. And so a lot of what we do is outsourced. And, mm -hmm. and I think, um, you know, Rich's probably done a lot of that kind of stuff as well. And it just means that I don't get, I don't need to get bogged down in so much. Like even with the collective we were talking about before, um, you know, the actual magazine, I don't commission the articles and things Great. anymore. So it, it removes you and I think that's really important. Mm. So you can hold that big vision. Yeah, definitely. So a last question, yes. I guess, to wrap up. <laughs> you obviously don't feel the fear that often or if you do, you push through it really quickly. Yeah. Do you have any final words of advice for people who struggle to push through that fear barrier? Yeah, I, I mean, I think fear is the greatest, um, you know, inhibitor for us achieving our dreams, and it's only our own, you know, perception of 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 what is actual is actual. And I wrote about this a bit in my book recently, Daring and Disruptive, about you know um, what's what's actual and what's perceived. And I kind of go, well, you know, if you're standing on the edge of a cliff, that is probably an actual danger, um, and you probably should remove yourself from that situation. But so many of the fears are just things that haven't yet happened. And so what I've done is, I mean, A, I've been in business, my own business now for 13 years, so pretty much anything that's going to happen has happened in mm -hmm. some iteration or another along the way. And I've learned that, well, I'm still here and it's okay. So. I kind of have become a bit desensitized to those things and I'm able to move through it quickly. Um, but the other thing is putting a great team in place. You know, I have amazing lawyers now and, you know, accountant and CFO and just people who are all external but can really sort of support me. And so 
I realised that I don't have to take everything on and hold everything myself, that there's a team of people that I can quickly, you know, um, get them to, mobilise them to deal with things. I think um, a lot of entrepreneurs, and particularly solopreneurs and startups, kind of take everything on themselves. Mm. And it's just about starting to let some of that go and not yeah. feeling so isolated and alone. And I think that removes a lot of the fear. Fantastic. Great advice as always. It's been wonderful having you join us here Thanks, in The Hunter. Guys. Thank you for joining us on UQTV once again, Lisa. Yeah, beautiful. I look forward to being back again soon. Great. <laughs> Did you like this video? If so, please share it with your team, your colleagues and maybe even your boss. And finally, if you want even more resources to increase your impact, influence and income, then head on over to uqpower.com.au and check out our videos, articles and resources there. Keep on building a life, a business or a career that plays to your unique strengths. The best thing that you can do to change the world is start with you. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time on UQTV.